behavior. I can tell you something else that's very interesting about, about men and violence. Um, I don't know if I can get this story straight because it's been a while since I told it. Yeah. So there's this interesting phenomena that, that's very characteristic of, of, of societies, I believe, pretty much everywhere it's being studied. Now, you can calculate an index called the Gini coefficient. And the Gini coefficient is a, a number that represents how much inequality of income distribution there is in a given geographical area. So you could calculate a Gini coefficient for a street or, uh, you know, um, an area in a city or a city or a state or a country. You can do it at all those levels. And uh, what you find is, you know, you, you always hear this idea that poverty causes crime. That's a classic left-wing idea, but it's wrong. It's seriously wrong, and it's importantly wrong, and it's de definitively wrong, not only that. So there's no argument about this. It's already been established. What causes crime, especially aggressive crime, is relative poverty. And relative poverty is not the same thing as poverty at all. It's seriously not the same thing. Poverty is when you don't have enough to eat. Relative poverty is when the guy next door has a much better car than you. So, and there's lots of relative poverty in the United States, and there's some absolute poverty, but even the absolute poverty in the United States is nothing like the absolute poverty, say, in places like India or in sub-Saharan Africa, where absolute poverty means you have nothing. Now, what's really interesting about the Gini coefficient is that if you go to places where everyone, roughly speaking, is, is poor, say by national standards, um, I, I think South Dakota was often used as an example, or maybe one of the maritime provinces, um, like Newfoundland, where there's, where there's low average income, but it's pretty flat distribution. There's almost no crime. And if you go to places where the, everyone's rich, then there's almost no crime. But if you go places where there are poor people and moderately well-off people and rich people and the distribution is really steep, then the rate of aggressive behavior among young men, and it's usually within their own ethnic group, starts to sp skyrocket out of control. And the reason for that seems to be that if the dominance hierarchy is too steep, then the young men have no likelihood of climbing to a dominant position while playing the standard social game. And so what they do is turn to aggression, aggression to, to make their mark on the world. And it works too. That's the other thing, is that make no mistake about it. If you're, if you're looking for status in a place where status is hard to achieve, and you're the meanest, toughest guy around, then, and you know, around a bunch of people who, like you, don't have much money, then you're going to benefit from that status. It, it, it works. Yeah? Would that be, um, would that be uh, part of the reason why, because I know the, I think that the violent crime rate in the U.S. is higher than it is in Canada. Would that be part of the reason why? Sure. Or, okay. Sure. Yeah, I mean, you can make a real conservative argument for making sure that, you know, the conservatives are very anti-income distribution, and, and we figure that's because of the guys that have this male independence. You know, they identify with this male independence factor. They don't want to be distributing resources to people who are, down the dominance hierarchy, because they, will, they want them down in the dominance hierarchy. They want there to be a difference between the people on top and the people on the bottom, so that they can be the people on top, so that it increases their relative attractiveness. Like, it's a perfectly logical game. And they presume that, well, the rules are set up, and, like, every man can go for it, do his best, and the winner wins and the loser loses, and that's just how it is. And don't ask me to fix it, because I, I don't want to, you know. And it, besides that, it's... I don't find it, I find it distasteful to attempt to fix it, more than that, right? Because it's a moral issue, it's not just a, an intellectual issue. So, so you, you can make a case, however, you can make a case from the conservative point of view, especially with regards to, say, beliefs in religious traditionalism and the desire to maintain social stability, that you shouldn't let income distribution become too unequal. Like, one of the big things your society has to do is to make sure that that doesn't get out of hand because it tends to get out of hand. It tends towards a few people having everything and almost everyone else having nothing. It's a natural, in, in a sense, it's a natural consequence of economic progression, which is actually something that Marx pointed out, although an Italian named Perito had figured it out at approximately the same time, and I think with a lot more conceptual clarity. But 
the more unequal you let your society get, the higher the probability of, of death, roughly speaking, through, through violent causes. And, you know, um, but, but, but I'm telling you why it is, is that, you know, men want to climb the dominance hierarchy, and the reason they want to climb the dominance hierarchy is because that's how they get access to women. I was going to uh, actually ask earlier in, in this discussion when you were talking about um, the familiar and the unfamiliar and the structure. Um, so it seems like we all want to live within a structure, but we don't want the rules to apply to ourselves. Well, we, we have this contradictory problem. We want to be protected by the structure, but we want to advance our position within it. And so that means what that should mean, and this is, I, I think, the definition of civilized behavior, is that you're allowed to advance your position within the structure as long as you don't disrupt it negatively. You know, and I think most people do do that. In fact, I think people in, in civilized countries do that so effectively that it's an absolute incomprehensible miracle. I can't understand how or why it ever got established. But like a psychopath will he climb the ladder and cut the rungs off underneath them, fundamentally, right? It's like he doesn't care. He doesn't even care if the damn thing maintains itself. You know, he's perfectly willing to have it destroyed after he's exhausted it. You know, but if everyone acted like that, or even if a, a fairly substantial percentage of people acted like that, the whole thing would come to a halt virtually, like, in, in no time, flat. So, so, I mean, why... See, you might... Here, here's a reason, likely. You know, because one of the things we were talking about was masculine violence. Now, the thing about masculine violence is it only tends to emerge in situations where there, doesn't, there don't seem to be any other reasonably viable means of advancing status. So it's not reasonable to say that men are aggressive. You can say that on average men are more aggressive than women. And you can also say that if, that if you put men in a situation where they have no... where they can see status differences but they have no means of moving forward, that they're likely to turn to aggression as a way of establishing dominance. And then you can say that that's, the reason for that is because it makes them more attractive. Well, the fundamental reason, yeah? Um, yeah, just like to add on, um, I read this article once that talks about how polygamous uh, societies are more violent than men. Yeah, and absolutely. It's for the same reason, because like, when, when one guy has two wives, that means there's 50% of the population have no wives. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. That the, 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 the evolutionary psychology explanation for the pathology of polygamy is that if once you let it establish itself, then the men get ultraviolent. So so would you say that like monogamy would almost be like a basis for like society? Many people have said that. And yes, I think you can make a strong case for that. And I think the fundamental reason is the one that you just pointed out. Okay. You know, the idea is, well, would you rather have one woman or die? You know, or sorry, that's not quite right. Would you rather? No, that's not quite. That's not quite right. Would you? It's more like, would you be willing to limit yourself to one partner, or have a shot at many partners, but a much higher probability of dying? Yeah. Right. And you know, some guys will take that. They'll take the the high risk approach. You know. So now, it, this doesn't eliminate the difference in individual differences in determining who's going to be aggressive, because what will happen is that as the Gini coefficient pressure rises, the more aggressive men, the men who are more aggressive by nature, will get more aggressive first, right? So you can imagine there, it's a threshold phenomenon in some sense. So, and I, what I should tell you as well is the relationship between the Gini coefficient and male on male homicide isn't like 0.2 or 0.3, which is about the, the correlation that you'd get if you were predicting something like that using personality. It's like 0.8 or 0.9. It's like it eats up all of it. It's the explanation. So it's a huge effect. You know, it's so, it's so big an effect that you can basically say, oh, well, we figured that out, although psychologists never know when they figured anything out, and they keep endlessly retesting it over and over and over because, you know, we don't know how to bring our science to a stop. But if you don't accept the Gini coefficient aggression data, it's like you might as well throw the rest of social sciences out the window because the, the effect is unbelievably powerful. It you can do it at any level of analysis. You can, do it, you can do it by county, you can do it by city, you can do it by state, and you can do it by country. And it works on all of those levels. Like it predicts aggression on all 
You bet. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's a great question. I mean, the methodologically sophisticated studies have done exactly that to ensure that, well, to ensure that it's actually this phenomena rather than other factors that might be operative in that particular geographical area. So countries with a higher Gini coefficient are more violent, and cities within that country that have a higher than average Gini coefficient for that country are more violent on average. It's a very, very robust, robust, robust finding. So, all right, so we're, we're going to say, for the sake of argument, that you've got the male dominance hierarchy, and it's represented 